For most of our history, when our ancestors looked into the rocks, they came across strange objects of all shapes and sizes. Exactly what these things were was anyone's guess, and more often than not, that's what we did. We used stories and legends to explain what we observed emerging out of the hills and crevices of the Earth. One story had it that the universe, the Earth, and all life was created in only six days, while we were given dominion over what was thought to be inferior forms of life. From the human perspective, this was a comforting prospect, one which seemed reasonable for a simpler people with no way of really knowing any different. In the year 1666, not long after the birth of modern science, Nicholas Steno, a young Danish anatomist, noted that the teeth of a shark he was studying looked strangely similar to the glossopetrae, or tongue stones, large pointed rocks often found eroding out of the mountainsides and gorges across Europe far from where anyone expected to find a giant shark. So Steno began to speculate as to how dead life forms could turn to rock, based on the concept that all matter is made out of particles. He also began to study the workings of the Earth, making countless contributions to the field of geology. So, in 1669, using a new experimental method for answering questions, recently developed by Galileo, science. Steno published his findings in what has come to be one of the greatest scientific works of all time, Prodromus. However, being a devout Catholic, Steno was unfortunately led to abandon his scientific efforts and rededicate himself to the suppression of the growing Protestant Reformation that was overtaking Europe. Nevertheless, Steno's brief, meteoric career in science and his tremendous discoveries that came from it holds a monumental place in the development of our understanding of the natural world. For perhaps the first time, these strange things found locked in stone, or fossils, could now begin to be understood. These fossils, found all over the earth, portraying bizarre, semi-mythic, often monstrous forms of life, all of which had somehow been mysteriously petrified into stone, no longer came solely under the purview of mystics and mythmakers. Gone were the days when the skeletons of dinosaurs were presumed to be griffins or dragons, or the skulls of Ice Age mammoths mistaken for the Cyclops, or the coiled shells of ammonites said to be decapitated snakes turned to stone through witchcraft. It was time for science to have a turn, to make a contribution to our understanding of beginnings. In the year 1784, the French anatomist George Cuvier examined the fossilized skull of a giant seagoing lizard from Maastricht and the flattened skeleton of a strange winged reptile from a limestone quarry in southern Germany and concluded that it was erroneous to think that such fantastic creatures were still alive today. It was obvious, he felt, that these anachronistic animals belonged to a different order of life, totally incompatible with what exists in the modern world. From this, he developed the concept of extinction, where entire forms of life could die out and be lost forever. Later, in 1830, from the work of the geologist Charles Lyell, we discovered that our world didn't just pop into existence fully formed and perfect once and forever. We discovered instead that the Earth was old, not young, that it has changed dramatically over its history, rather than being a singular, unchanging reality. But as Buckland, Owen, and Mantell thought, we were still the center of creation. In terms of origins, it may have seemed as if the answers were settled, self-evident, revealed, an intellectual dead end. This all changed in 1859, when an ambitious English naturalist named Darwin used the work of Cuvier and Lyell to theorize a natural origin for life, one based on strictly natural processes. With the power of evolutionary thinking, by giants like Huxley, Wallace, Marsh, Napstra, Dubois, and many others, we had a new way to understand the planet, life, and ourselves. Since their pioneering contributions, we have saved billions of precious fossils from erosion and ultimate loss, each one another tiny link in the great chain of genes and forms, transitions from one thing to many, all recorded in stone. In every corner of the globe, teams of scientists and volunteers continuously scour the earth for these precious proofs of life. These dedicated explorers on the seas of time endlessly toil, not to extract some commodity or resource for commercial exploitation, but rather to free the knowledge of former life forms on this planet, to add another verse or chapter to the Book of Life, 
to help us find our place in the grand story of evolution. From the sands of Mongolia's Gobi Desert to the badlands of Wyoming and Utah, paleontologists work to expand our understanding of the past. Whether crossing scorched dunes in Egypt and Morocco, or enduring freezing steppes in Svalbard and Antarctica, science presses on, digging and searching for more evidence, working to create a never-complete picture, struggling to fill in the gaps, find the links, and clarify our understandings. Paleontologists have filled museum halls around the world with the petrified remnants of ancient plants and animals, nearly erased by the Earth's dynamic forces. We've named and described hundreds of thousands of extinct species we never would have known existed, all of which are unique and beautiful in their own way. We've mapped our planet's surface, discovered how the continents themselves shift, tear, and collide, how erosion can carve, corrode, and expose miles of solid rock to create the greatest of natural wonders. We've unearthed the most ancient of life. We've seen into history's greatest catastrophes. We've made stunning predictions based off of evolutionary theory. We've traced the ancestry of modern plants and animals back through millions of years. We've unlocked the hidden relationship shared between all life. We've resurrected entire ecosystems through pencil and brush. We've decoded behavior of prehistoric animals, peered into their brains, and have begun to get a clear picture of where we came from. Together, this ever-accumulating library of fossil specimens serves to build a more and more complete narrative of the past, a living past, that is able to tell us the story of who we are, where we came from, and where we might be heading. But despite everything we've achieved so far, there are still those who wish to drag us back and trade everything we've learned for their creation myths. But they're too late. We know from whence we've come and we know the way ahead. Today, there are more paleontologists than there have ever been before. Venues like the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology allow experts to gather from around the world to share news of their new discoveries and debate issues. With the invention of the internet and the modern open access movement, the information about life's ever-changing story is more freely available than ever before. It's truly astounding how much we've come to know about the life forms we will never have the privilege to see. But I feel privileged that I happened to be born in the thin sliver of history in which the true brilliance and majesty of life has finally begun to be understood. But there is still much work to do. The work of science is never done. There will always be new discoveries to be made, new fossils to find, and new techniques to study them, which will illuminate our collective history. The truth is, we're just getting started. The Earth was not forged in six days. We were not specially created, and nor are we any better than other life, as we had been taught for so long. Where our ancestors saw mythical beings filled with magic and supernatural powers, we today can discern magic of a different kind. The magic and mystery of the natural world. The magic of how life on Earth develops, evolves, and transforms. And though when our ancestors looked into the rocks at the petrified remnants of ancient life, they did not see a well-organized panoply of species caught in the frozen mid-step of natural selection. They did recognize the beauty, and that part hasn't changed. Now, we get to look at life in a new light, one offered to us by science, which has taught us that all life, no matter how apparently unrelated or obscure, is part of the same tree, and every branch leads back to the same trunk. Every living organism that has ever existed on this planet is one and no amount of borders or wars, political or religious differences, will ever change that. I'm not a scientist, just a teenager with dreams of becoming one. But if you haven't noticed by now, I care deeply about this. Paleontology has become a huge part of my life, so I've decided to channel my love for this knowledge where I can share it with the public, in hopes of convincing you that this stuff matters. Not just to a handful of specialists, but to humanity, and all the children in all the world. This knowledge belongs to all of us. So here, on The Living Past, I'll be creating short documentaries about dinosaurs, fossils, evolution, and the history of life. I'll probably be spending the rest of my life working to understand our place in nature and exploring the Earth's many lost worlds, nearly forgotten to time. And quite frankly, I couldn't be more excited. So come join me, because the view ahead looks spectacular.